Okay, so this is week three. Um, I'm going to warn you right now that this is the most boring lecture. Uh, maybe tied with next week. This week and next week are very, very boring. Um, and you're probably thinking, why would she tell us that? Um, the reason this lecture is, I'm gonna apologize, my kids are home and they're running around, so you might, you might hear them periodically. Um, we're, uh, it's been a long time, um, and we're trying to get some work done. So we're both stealing moments, uh, in front of the computer when we have it. Um, so this week is the, le this week and next week are the lecture that, um, everybody assumes you guys know all this stuff. Well, I, everybody assumes you all know this stuff. Um, but there's been no one to teach it to you. So what I've tried to do is fit it into my program, um, or my course outline. Basically, I often call this the lists of considerations lecture. Um, there aren't really answers in it. For the most part, it's about exposing you to what's typical. So it's, um, where it's so boring, I didn't want to just have it be jam-packed right full to the end of three hours of absolute boringness. So um, this week and next week are both on the shorter side, I'd say, uh, but uh, it, it gives you a chance to kind of take a breather in between the two weeks. So this week, we're going to look at the different materials. Um, basically, when would you pick what? Why would you use this particular material? Um, hold on one second. Sorry, that was just a phone call saying that uh, the school bus is canceled for the whole week because our bus driver, they can't tell us what's wrong. Um, uh, there's implication that she was hurt somehow. It could be COVID, but we have no idea. Um, but it's irrelevant because our kids are home all week as well because last week we're pretty sure I got COVID uh, and the kids were set to go back yesterday yesterday right yesterday yeah. uh and we just had a gut feel we kept them home yesterday and they both got fevers yesterday so uh here we are for another five days which means they had one day one day one day okay so this this lecture we're going to go through and we're going to talk about each material um when you would use it and why you would use it next week we're going to look at a lot of pictures and I mean a lot of pictures um, that kind of go through and I've broken them into each individual material simply so that you can go back and take a look at them um, if you don't know how things go together so if you're like I, I often will see people draw a steel beam sitting on a steel beam with a joist sitting on top of that making the assembly three things deep well, steel, you can connect them into the sides of each other usually. But if you forget that, going to look at an image is very helpful. So you can get a lot of the answers from the images I've posted. There's also the typical details that I talked about with you uh, last week or two weeks ago um, that you can go and take a look at as well. Um, so it, these are kind of almost like um, reference material. Um, you just want to see how some things go together in real images. Um, uh, and then at the week after that, we'll talk about preliminary sizing guidelines. And so we'll look at more images or we'll look at some of those images and we'll talk about why things are the length they are and why things are the depth they are and kind of put those things together. Um, I got uh, an email from one student asking if we would do more uh, tributary area and tributary width examples in this lecture. Um, uh, no, because it takes, it's a huge amount of time to generate um, uh, examples that are just difficult enough that, and not too difficult. Even when I go back and look at old drawings, they're, they're way beyond what I would want you guys to do. That said, um, we walked through a bunch last week. I had some extra ones in there last week. The assignment answers will be posted, um, after uh probably probably on thursday or friday 
Um, and just remember that um, uh, an open area has no floor. So if it's open to below, there's no floor there, which means there's no load on it. Um, I also gave that person the advice. I did a I did a quick Google search. Just maybe maybe you didn't like the way I described it. Maybe you were looking for more uh, kind of ex example information. I'm not technically allowed to give those to you, uh, but if you wanted to go on your own and search for more examples and see maybe other images of how, how people have gone about it, they're all going to be the same thing. They're all gonna come back to the same core bit of information, um, but sometimes it's helpful for people to just see it again and again and again, so feel free to do that. Um, so, we're gonna talk about the role of the structure this week. We're gonna go through each of the materials, their advantages and disadvantages. Um, then I'm going to talk about when we would use each material, like why would you pick one over the other? Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about the elements within a building, what they, what they specifically do. Um, and when we do that, I will need my handy frames that I have made, which have I lost them again? These keep disappearing on me. Here we go. So we'll use, we'll use these when we talk about it. Possibly the deck I made as well. Okay. <clears throat> so what's the role of structure? What's its job? Why do we have it? What's it doing? Well, it's got to hold up itself. And it's there to hold up the envelope that's wrapped around the building and the loads we put inside it. And really that's all we're trying to do is take the weight of these things and then the building has things on it as well and get them down into the ground. And that's really the role of what we're trying to do here. So what are the main types of uh, construction that we're gonna talk about or the main materials we're gonna talk about? Well, structural steel is going to be the one that's kind of the easiest for us to work with. Um, it's It's got some real advantages that make it the easiest one for you guys to do calculations with. So we will, over the next two terms, be talking about all the materials, but structural steel is going to be the one that we end up doing most of our calculations with, simply because, well, you'll see, and we'll talk about it in one of the uh, advantages in a minute reinforced concrete so concrete without any steel rebar inside it is unreinforced concrete we would rarely use that for anything structural usually it's landscape elements and small bits um but uh uh hold on a second i'm getting messages okay sorry everyone there was just a whole um oh I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> a colleague sent something, what I felt was something inappropriate. So I was, had been reaching out to some other uh, other people on advice on how to proceed and uh, communicate. No, guys, guys, guys. Okay. No, 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 no. Guys, uh, I'm recording a lecture. Uh, other room, other room, other room. Okay. Okay, sorry everyone. It's crazy here all the time. Anyway, um, yeah, so I was just asking, I was reaching out to colleagues and kind of asking their, their take on it and what they would do um, in a situation like that. Um, so uh, what other types of construction are we going to talk about? Well, wood, I used to have in this lecture, wood clumped as one, one topic. Because most of the wood we did was nominal lumber. And sometimes maybe there'd be a little bit on mass timber, but it was usually more like a, an asterisk within the, within the slides. Um, but in the past five years, mass timber has become the most popular construction material. Maybe not the most used, but certainly the most popular. And so that's not um, our, our nominal lumber. So nominal lumber is houses, um, maybe small apartment buildings, like the four story ones, even up to six. Um, mass timber is large pieces of wood. 
And that has really taken off with a lot of the revisions in the building code on what can and can't be done now. And so we'll touch on that a little tiny bit. Precast concrete is very similar to reinforced concrete, except it's smaller discrete elements that are fabricated in a shop and then shipped to site. So in some ways you lose some of the benefits of concrete, but you gain some benefits as well. Load bearing masonry, and then alternative construction techniques. We're going to focus mainly on the top four uh, categories. I'll show pictures of, of most of them. So let's start with concrete. And remember, I said I really like lists um, for uh, assignment questions and exam questions. So I guarantee you have these written down on a piece of paper somewhere for yourself because there will guaranteed be questions on the exam uh, from these lists. I usually try to do at least one for each material. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm still very congested, so, so I apologize if periodically I cough and um, um, have to stop to blow my nose or something. And my temperature keeps going up and down, so I'll uh, take off my blanket and take off my slippers and then get cold and put it all back on. So you'll see me, if you see me squirming around, I'm just trying to get my slippers back on now. Okay, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of concrete? And I'm going to qualify this with this, this isn't, these aren't always limits to it. These are just reasons um, to check yourself when you're making decisions about what material to use. So, um, uh, uh, so concrete, it's adaptable. What do we mean by adaptable? Well, it can make beautiful, amazing forms. One of the things I always like to say to students is that, um, you know, in the 50s and 60s, the construction market was governed by the cost of material. Material was very, very, very expensive and labor was very, very, very cheap. Um, and so putting uh, more people or more time into refining the element that was being constructed to take material out was of real cost savings, which made concrete kind of fantastic. Because concrete can be sculpted, <clears throat> um, it's labor intensive and difficult, but if it saves material, um, it was seen as a real advantage. So you're, we're going to see pictures of concrete over the coming days um, where concrete looks like it's these beautiful works. And you'll often hear people talk about it being a lost art to do that with concrete. When in reality, the cost of materials dropped and the cost of labor went up. And so now, rather than if this was uh, the zone that we had a concrete beam, rather than forming the underside of it to be this beautiful arch where it's moment connected at the ends, well, <clears throat> now we would just make it that flat section. A slab, waffle slabs, for example, which those are the ones that literally look like a waffle, it's flat on top, but a waffle on the underside, um, forming all of those notches was very expensive, but now it's considered cheaper just to make it flat. Um, so it's adaptable, but we don't do it a lot anymore because it's um, expensive because of labor. Um, this is just a point where I want to mention one thing, is that we're in an interesting point in our kind of economy of construction that we're on this threshold of what governs the cost is changing as well. Maybe not even cost, what governs construction. Um, before it was material costs, for the past 60 years it's been labor costs, and we're on the verge of switching to something else. It could be, uh, it's probably going to be um, environmentally or cl climatic related uh, govern governance, um, uh, but it's going to be something else. And we're at, at this threshold right now. Um, we're 50 years from now, it'll be so obvious, but right now standing on the cusp, it's not apparent what's going to govern our construction 
I want to use the word market, but market ties so heavily into cost that I, I, I'm reluctant to use that. But, but market, what governs why and how we build with what materials. Concrete has a really short lead time. It's pretty fantastic for that. I, uh, if if um, my tender was signed tomorrow, they could probably start work on site with concrete almost immediately. They could get out there very, very quickly. Concrete has a shallow depth of structure. Now, how is that possible? I'm gonna draw a little picture here for you. I'm gonna use a nice, fat, thick marker. So, concrete is very uniform. A concrete slab is going to be very uniform like that. The same system in steel the same system in steel is going to look something like this. So if these were open web steel joists with a metal deck on it, you can see that this is consistently all very shallow, probably about half the depth of that. This locally is very, very shallow, but we have these parts that are deeper. So there are advantages to both of those depending on what your building requirements are, but concrete can have a consistent shallow depth of structure. Concrete can often be the finish. Depending on your situation or your circumstances, it is the finish. It also makes it easy to apply finishes. They're just, they can be a thin sheet of something if we do need a further finish. Concrete is non-combustible. It also has a good fire rating. Those are not the same things. So combustibility is literally, will it burn? Can it burn? A fire rating is how well does it perform during a fire around it. So some things can be non-combustible and have a good fire rating. Things can be combustible and have a good fire rating. Things can be non-combustible and have a good fire rate. I said that one already. Uh, things can be non-combustible and have a bad fire rating. So they're not all the same things. Some building types have a flat out clause. You cannot use not you cannot use combustible material. Combustible material either needs to be protected uh, or you have to use non combustible material. So it has a good fire rating as well, which means during a fire, concrete maintains its strength. It has good acoustic qualities and it can be ductile. Now concrete by itself is a brittle material. We're gonna talk a lot about what ductility and brittle means in structures too, but think of ductility as meaning um, it can absorb a lot of energy. Now again, the concrete itself is brittle, it cannot. But reinforced concrete, which is what I'm talking about in this course, can absorb a lot of energy because we put steel in it and steel is very ductile. Uh, concrete has really good corrosion resistance. So we think of, um, uh, when we think of concrete, we tend to think of all the negative applications. Um, so if anyone's uh, driven under the gardener, for example, you look up and you'll see like exposed rebar and chunk, you always hear stories about spalling concrete under the gardener. Well, there's two things to kind of think about there. And one is that the gardener is, it was built in the 50s, I believe, with a 50 year lifespan. And so we're almost one and a half times its lifespan already. So it has outperformed what it was designed to do already. It doesn't owe us much. Um, uh, the second thing is, uh, it's actually a super corrosive environment. Think of all the salt that we put on uh, roadways. Um, so it's outperformed in an extremely corrosive environment. So concrete, surprisingly, is really good for corrosion resistance. What are the disadvantages of concrete? Well, it can't span that far. It is one of the unique materials that its own self-weight 
starts to govern its uh, ability to span distances. So <coughs> I almost feel like weight should be right there beside spans. So as it gets longer, we need it to be deeper, but at a certain point, its own self weight starts to be what governs the design. Alterations. Concrete is really bad for alterations. So if we had, um, we had a wall in steel um, and a wall in concrete, we had um, this like this and we have a door here in our concrete wall and this is our steel wall. Well, if we wanted to move that wall to another bay, concrete, we could do it. It's no problem in the steel. We can just go plop that wall in, that door in anyway, anywhere. But in our concrete wall, this has structure in it. There's a lot of little bits of structure all the way through the length of the wall. That's our reinforcing. In a concrete building, it isn't obvious what reef bar is doing what, when, and where. Obviously the engineer would know, but it's not obvious to look at it. In the steel building, we can say in this whole length of wall, that's where our lateral load resisting system is, and we're good. As long as we don't cut through, as long as we don't cut through there, we're fine. Uh, but maybe we can fit a small door in even there. Um, I was doing, uh, I was helping out uh, a contractor for a for a, an apartment complex in High Park. It was a simple building. Um, it had lateral, I'm gonna draw you what the plan, roughly what the plan looked like. So it was your classic building like that and there's an elevator core in the middle. And it was apartments. So there was a corridor, I'm not drawing it great. And in that direction, every single one of those walls was the lateral load resisting system for that direction. On one floor, right here, they wanted to put one tiny little door in, right there. So I looked at it, it worked by inspection. Yes, you can say it works by inspection. Um, it was just so obvious that there was an abundance of lateral load resisting system there. Um, in fact, it was, I did the calculation, I think it was 10 times what it was in the other direction. Um, and it just worked by inspection. The building department said, no. So I was like, all right, I did some calculations. I said, yeah, you can put this in. They're like, no, we demand um, a 3D structural analysis of this building to show that that door can come out. I felt really bad because the owner's just trying to put a small door in the wall. They're not trying to redesign um, uh, like a, 15 story concrete building. Um, <clears throat> so I pointed out, I, I actually wrote a memo to the building department um, because I found it very unjust um, that it, it, is very, it is common practice to use um, uh, 150 millimeters or 152 millimeters kind of in exchange on a lot of things, um, uh, imperial and metric you just kind of forget about those two millimeters often. Like if I'm working in metric and the last designer worked in Imperial, it would be just a given that you drop those two millimeters. Maybe they designed it in metric and they built it in Imperial and so you have an extra two millimeters. I pointed out that that small accepted change um, was like the difference of putting 10 doors in this building. Um, uh, just to kind of point out the ridiculousness of what the building department was asking for. Now, I don't often decide to go head to toe, toe to toe with the building department. Um, it was just this one was, was clearly someone not thinking about um, what they were asking. It was, a, it was a check in a box. And so we needed to kind of solve that problem. Um, disadvantages, construction sensitive to weather. For those of you that are here in Toronto right now, you know how freaking cold it is and has been for a while and snowstorms. Um, 
contractors have to bear that risk. So there is a cost contingency built into concrete construction. I remember one year, I'm going to say it was the winter of 2012, 2013. It was one of the coldest on record here in Toronto. <clears throat> it was freezing. Construction basically just ground to a halt for about two months over the winter. Um, the next winter, it was one of the mildest winters we've ever had, and construction basically continued unstopped throughout the entire year. Um, but a contractor can't know that, and so they have to build that risk into their project no matter what. Um, and owners have to understand if they have a set deadline that the weather can't be controlled. Quality control is difficult in uh, concrete. Now, I know I'm spending a lot of time on this list because I'm introducing the concepts to you. And some of the other materials will go through these lists a little bit faster. Um, so quality control is really tough in concrete. Um, <clears throat> there's two reasons why it's difficult to do quality control in concrete. One is if they've cast the concrete, you can't see the reinforcing anymore and you have almost zero control for your quality control. Um, but even when we can go to the site and see the reinforcing, which we're supposed to always get to do before they do a pour, it is, again, a lot of little materials continuously throughout the project. And if you needed um, 15 M bars at 300 millimeters center to center, so that means every 12 inches you need a piece of steel and there's the top layer doing it and the bottom layer doing it so there's four layers of steel doing that what if the con what if the contractor set them all out at um you know 13 inches instead of 12 inches visually you can't tell the difference in that it could result in a drastic difference in the amount of reinforcing over a huge slab area, for example. So it starts to get really difficult to do your quality control. It takes some patience and you have to go with a tape measure um, and do spot checks all over the building. Um, whereas some other materials, it's a, oh, yep, you missed that right there. And it's an easy way to check it. We talked about weight. Uh, we build it twice. So a concrete building, we have to build a wood building that holds up the liquid concrete. It cures, and then we take the wood building away. Now, what makes concrete um, kind of cost, cost worthy is being able to reuse that temporary wood building again and again and again, or as many times as we possibly can. We call that the formwork. So what makes concrete um, possible is trying to reuse the formwork as much as possible. Um, and then there's also the, you, did you lose your phone? You could just tell me. Uh, it, well, he can't, he's deaf in one ear. He can't find it from this. I apologize for all the distractions today. Um, I believe he's taking the kids outside now, so that should settle things down a tiny little bit. Um, he is deaf in one ear, so he can't locate sound by hearing it. Um, it's a bit difficult for him and he had lost his phone. And so he was using my phone to find his phone, which it would take him 10 times as long to do. So we found his phone. It's all good. All right. So the final concrete disadvantage, and this one is huge, the environmental cost. This is something that wasn't even talked about 10 years ago. Um, it is, I'm seeing a lot of um, studio projects uh, in universities just ban concrete. No, you cannot use concrete in your uh, studio project. So it's a, real, it's a real conversation and this is when I was saying that we're on a, the cusp of seeing um, what governs design or how we build buildings change. Um, and the, I think the environmental cost is going to become one of our major driving forces in what governs that. And the environmental cost of concrete is huge. There are whole cartels around the sand industry and the sand has to be very specific sand um, uh, that comes from very specific locations. It needs to have the correct amount of silica in it. It's a very precise thing uh, and it's it's a huge environmental cost all right when do we use concrete why 
why would we use concrete? If you guys remember in the first lecture, I said, um, uh, understand your precedents, refine when appropriate, innovate when necessary. And the first thing is understanding your precedents. <coughs> and these are basically your precedents. Concrete. Oh my God, those kids need to go outside. <laughs> Okay, uh, concrete is fantastic for mid-rise apartment buildings and mid-rise office buildings. The reason it's great for those is because the floor plate is the same, usually, over several floors, and it is cost-effective to build your wood building and then fly your form up to the next floor. So they swing it out, bring it up to the next floor, and pour the concrete on that. Wait seven days, take the, take the wood out, and build it again up until your your height in the higher buildings steel tends to start to come back into play simply because of the seismic and wind criteria um, uh, and it starts to get hard to actually get the concrete up there as well parking garages parking garages are kind of ubiquitous for concrete construction foundations um, uh, so parking garages and foundations foundations we need structure everywhere Remember the drawing I did of uh, our, our wall here? The steel building has large parts with no structure in it, like that. Our concrete wall is all structure except for where we take structure out. In a foundation or in a basement, we need something to hold that soil back everywhere. And if we need something to hold it back everywhere that is structure, often concrete makes sense. So as much as I'd argue kind of some of the pros and cons of, of concrete, um, it does sometimes have its perfect place in construction. One of them would be in foundation. So if you're going to use concrete, foundations is a good place to use it. Concrete's great for unique structures. Remember that whole thing where I said it was very adaptable? You could form really amazing shapes with it. It's great for unique structures in that way. <clears throat> what affects the cost of concrete. Well, the formwork, like I said, you're building it twice. The time of year, if you can start construction in late March and finish by uh, the first week of November, you're probably going to be in good shape. If you're planning on doing all your construction over the winter, you could end up finding it costs a lot more. Spans, the longer the span, the more concrete you need um, in a very kind of non-linear way which can make it very expensive. Uh, loading, I mean, that's gonna be typical for most things, um, but the loads we put on it, concrete is very sensitive to a load increase. Uh, strength of concrete and concrete additives. So I would specify the strength needed for my concrete, but the, the people who actually make the concrete mix, they do it to their standards. So they would actually make the strength of the concrete and they would add additives that they might need to add. Maybe they need it to flow really well. Maybe it's kind of on the cold end of things and so they need to add some, some things to it to help it uh, work better in cold weather. Maybe it's hot weather additives that they need. <clears throat> so there are things that we can add to concrete based on environmental uh, issues or maybe they need a quick curing time because construction is going really fast. Um, all of those things done by the supplier can add cost as well. <coughs> I apologize, I'm really not feeling super. Um, so steel. What are the advantages and disadvantages in steel construction? Okay, well, steel is strong and stiff and light. Um, now, I've often heard people say light. To give you context, steel uh, weighs 77 kilonewtons per meter cubed and concrete weighs 23 kilonewtons per meter cubed. So concrete is almost, is around three times the weight, or a third the weight of steel. Steel is three times the weight of concrete. Why would I say steel is light? Well, because it's strong and because it's stiff, we don't need as much steel. 
for its weight, it can do a lot more work than concrete can. Um, so even though it's a heavier material, we need so little of it because it's strong and stiff that we end up with a lighter structure. Steel is great for making long spans and we can have small columns. Small columns can be really important in the footprint of our building. We have large concrete columns that steal retail space that could be a deal breaker for our owner. Uh, quality control. It's really easy to do quality control for steel for two reasons. The first one is that we get a set of really good shop drawings that show how everything go together with dimensions. They use that to make it in their shop. I get, or the engineer gets an opportunity to review it. So does the architect. We have a really good opportunity to basically look at the building before it's been built review how they're going to put it together and then when we go to site it's really easy to see if things are missing um, uh, it's usually pretty easy to tell if something hasn't been done as intended it can be installed very 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 fast now the concrete <clears throat> could get going very fast but it takes a long time to install it so you would uh, do your first floor, no problem. Then you have to wait seven days until you can move up and start to work on the next story. And then you have to wait seven days until you can move up to the next story. Uh, a steel building, theoretically, you can do several stories in a day um, <clears throat> if it's a relatively small building uh, and it's not that complex. So steel can be installed quickly. But look over here, it's got a long lead time. So remember that process I said about shop drawings and quality control? A lot of it has a lot of front end work. So it's interesting to note that for the steel and the concrete, from the date of hiring them to the date it's finished is actually often very similar, but concrete is on the ground working the whole time. Steel, it looks like nothing's being done. And then you get to site and it all happens very quickly. That can be important depending on the type of uh, contract the, co the, the, the owner has with the bank because some banks will only pay out based on the visible construction happening on the site. Um, uh, so sometimes that can come into play. Uh, we talked about future alterations in steel. We know exactly where the structure is so we can come back and do whatever we want quite easily uh, at any point later on. Fabrication benefit. Steel, where it's made in the shop, we can do really unique things. Um, uh, remember how I've said that labor is expensive? Labor is expensive, but it's cheaper in the shop. On-site labor is much more expensive than in the shop labor expenses. So trying to build a truss in the shop is not, uh, is not a crazy thing to do anymore. It can be uh, you can build something quite custom in the shop and then bring it to site and install it. <clears throat> Steel is non-combustible. If you stick it in a fire, it won't catch fire. But come over here and look at this. Poor fire rating. So steel in a fire loses its strength very quickly. Um, <clears throat> uh, in the, uh, the Twin Tower collapse, um, people often talk about the fact that um, it, it, it failed because the planes hit it. Well, in fact, it had actually been designed to resist the load of the planes. They actually did do a design calculation for that. Um, uh, and as you saw, there was a lot of local damage and a huge amount of local damage uh, where the planes actually impacted the building, but the building stood. There was a, other things at play, something about the way the shoe uh, for the joists were installed. There's a few things at play in this, but one of the major ones was the fact that the, uh, the plane destroyed the fire protection for the steel. Duncan. I'm getting a snack from Grandma put snacks in it. You're getting snacks for your walk? Yeah. Here, come over here. Let Daddy get the snacks. Come over here with me for a minute. Come here. Well, you're going to stay with me while I, I talk to my students. <clears throat> um, and so 
that was uh, the the heat then of the jet no, fuel. Me on the Um, so the, the heat from jet fuel burns at a much higher rate than normal fire. Um, and with the fire protection destroyed uh, on the steel, uh, the steel lost its structural integrity very, very, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so as much as they designed it to withstand um, a plane impact, uh, it was kind of the combination of all of those things that had such unfortunate and dire uh, results. Stay out of the snack cupboard. Daddy is getting the snacks. I'll get the snacks. No. Okay. Then again. I'm getting two for One. Make sure you get one for your brother. I got two. Okay. okay. Uh, vibration. Uh, vibration. <clears throat> okay, guys. Okay, I'm very, very sorry. Um, they're gone. Uh, it's Wednesday afternoon, and I, it's not like I can delay recording this, so I, I apologize for all the distractions, but it is impossible trying to do everything that needs to be done with two small kids at home. And I wanna make sure I don't um, let you guys down. So it's a, it's a really tight balancing act, especially considering I was sick, um, and they've been sick, so. Okay, I don't know how long they'll be gone, so let's get through this. <laughs> okay, so other disadvantages, um, vibration. One of the things, one of the thing, there's different things about vibration, but one of the things about vibration is that heel drop. Remember when I said you drop your heels and how it dampens the, the vibration? Well, because steel is light, relatively speaking, because of how little of it we use, tends to transfer vibration really easily. Um, so often we'll put toppings on it, so concrete toppings on top of our steel elements to help with that vibration issue. And again, depth. So remember we said that here's our nice uniform concrete depth. Well, our steel, if you look at the overall depth, usually ends up being quite a bit deeper. So where and when would you use a steel building? They're great for very low buildings and for very, very, very high buildings. Concrete tends to be that sweet spot in between. Shopping centers can be great in steel. Uh, hospitals are great in steel. Schools can be good in steel. Warehouses and, and industrial buildings are almost always steel, except for the few I've seen that are tilt up construction. Um, tilt up construction isn't a thing we do often here, but uh, where I'm from in Nova Scotia, we see a lot of it. Um, I'll show you slides of that next week. Don't worry about it. We're not going to be spending any time talking about tilt up, but steel applications, almost always warehouses and industrial buildings are going to be built out of steel because of that long span, small column issue. <clears throat> systems building. So what's a systems building? That usually means something designed by a supplier. So if any of you have ever been in an arena, you've probably seen that classic style of, of uh, building construction where every it's usually about every six meters um, they have uh, a steel frame um, and the steel usually tapers and then tapers down again those are butler or balin buildings often called that here in north america because those are the suppliers for those buildings there are other suppliers as well but it's kind of like calling kleenex kleenex and q-tips q-tips um, here we tend to often call those uh, system buildings Balin or Butler buildings. <clears throat> so in the past I had wood as one topic. I've since broken it up into two topics because the advantages and disadvantages are not the same. This slide is residential wood construction. What do I mean by residential wood construction? I'm talking about using nominal lumber or normal wood, if you were gonna go into Home Depot and buy lumber, we're talking about residential construction. So that's two by fours to two by twelves, possibly some small engineered wood products, but still in the scale of what we would use in residential construction. So what are the advantages of wood in this type of construction? Well, economy, it's very, very cheap. It's very cheap, cheap to build wood construction, I know. 
the past year and a half to two years make a liar out of me. But even then, it was still one of the cheaper uh, ways to build. Supply started to become a bit of an issue. But if you could get a hold of it, even at two and a half times its normal price, it was still cheaper than uh, some other types of construction. <clears throat> Lead time, very, very fast, because you can just go down the street and pick up the lumber. Uh, you can start construction usually the day you decide to build something. Uh, it gets installed quickly. It goes up very fast. If you have skilled laborers, it goes even faster. You have a reliable, a bit, well, not reliable, you have an available workforce. Um, if I wanted to, I could call up a bunch of uh, other moms that I know and be like, hey, I'm building a deck. Come on over. I'll supply the beer and pizza. You come over and uh, we'll build a deck together. So you don't need any special training uh, to build in wood construction. Steel and concrete, heavily unionized, um, and, bare, and you need skilled labor uh, to do it. Um, so uh, wood construction, you can just have anybody do it, essentially. It has surprisingly good thermal properties. Um, I have uh, a cottage on Lake Nipissing that I bought. Um, uh, so it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's like a four and a half hour drive, and then you have to, it's on an island. It's the only building on an island in the middle of the lake. Uh, so you have to boat to get it. <clears throat> I've walked across the lake in the winter to get to it. And its construction is unique. It is just um, two by sixes standing up all the way around together. They're tongue and groove, so they're kind of tongue and groove together. Um, but it is a unique style of construction. Um, and in the winter, I've been there when it was minus 10. And if I got a good fire going, I could get it quite warm in there, unless there was wind. Because there was no envelope, around that, no barrier on that wood. Any nooks and crannies, all the wood would come through and it was impossible to get it warm. Even if it was on a windy day, if it's five degrees out, it can be hard to get that building warm. But on a calm day at much colder temperatures, you can usually get it pretty warm. Uh, and it's got treatment options. So you can do things to help protect it from the weather, um, from fire, uh, from rot. Um, it is surprisingly corrosion, corrosion resistant. Um, it's funny, wood uh, kept under water is actually pretty great. Um, they used to actually store it underwater sometimes. Um, so if you can get your hands on uh, wood that's been underwater for a hundred years, there's access to kind of some of the big, big materials. Uh, it's environmentally neutral in properly managed forests. I like to, I like to say that um, specifically because that is an active part of it. If you just go and cut down all the trees in the forest, well then obviously it's not environmentally neutral. Um, it's great at carbon capture, but a huge part of it is maintaining the forest as well. Disadvantages. It is both combustible and has a bad fire rating. So it's combustible, it burns, and as it burns, it destroys the material and there's no structure left. So normal residential wood construction is combustible and has a bad fire rating. It is similar to steel in its weight ratio for vibration. In wood, connections govern all. You cannot put two pieces of wood together easily. Um, some of you have maybe worked in dovetailing and joinery. All beautiful things, but they're time intensive and they take away a lot of the material. So they're not as strong as the rest of the material. Um, so there's a real beauty and art to it. Um, and we're seeing some of that. I, there's a, a, a kind of a, a professor in uh, Germany I know who's researching heavily into all connections even being out of wood. But most of the time we're using steel to connect our two pieces of wood together. And the connections tend to govern the design. Member size, we can end up with large members. Um, there's the possibility for decay. Um, so I said it's corrosion resistant, but it decays pretty easily when we're in that zone of going in and out of moisture. It's that kind of transition that causes the problem. Um, and I can't remember if I've told you guys this or not, but um, at one point I owned a fish shack in Nova Scotia 
And when I say shack, I mean it was really a shack. It was, um, it perched out over the water. And I bought it sight unseen. Um, and there was actual holes in the ground. So if this was the building, this is land, and there's the building. Uh, there was actually a hole in the floor here where you could kind of see the tide go in and out. And I mean, not like a beautiful glass floor. I mean, the floor was basically like cardboard and you could see down into the ocean. Um, but it was also on a working um, fishing wharf. And this wharf, when they built it, there's a little bit of woods in behind it. They had gone into the woods and cut these posts down from small sapling trees to make this wharf. The water, if any of you know anything about Nova Scotia and the oceans there, they're known for their tides. Low tide, high tide. So the high tide, this part of the post gets wet, the tide goes down and it dries. It goes up and down, up and down, and it does that several times a day until that little bit of the wharf there, the post, actually rotted right away. So I had bought this sight unseen. <clears throat> My stepmother had gone and looked at it for me. And she was like, it's deteriorating and falling down. Don't buy it. So I was like, sold. You got yourself a deal. Uh, by the time I got to go see it several months later, uh, the wharf had actually collapsed. So that had rotted away to the point that that collapsed into the ocean. But the rest of the wood up above was still in perfect condition. In fact, it was in such good condition and now essentially had a spike on the bottom of it that it dug itself down into the ocean floor and you could still stand on that wharf. It just dropped down about two feet uh, in the far corner of the wharf. Uh, and then I've already talked about the fire resistance, it being both combustible and not fire resistant. So its disadvantage is its fire resistance. It's bad. All right, mass timber. So this is not the same as residential wood construction. This is very similar to a lot of the pros and cons of steel, or at least the process of obtaining it and building with it is the same. The material is different, but the process is similar. So um, it's fast erection, but it has a long lead time. Um, wood has really good thermal properties, which steel doesn't, so that's an advantage, but that comes down to the material itself. Treatment options, good because it's wood. It's corrosion resistant. It's fire resistant, so it has a good fire rating. So look over here, combustible is still a disadvantage, but it has good fire resistance. Our other piece of wood did not. Now there's two reasons for this. I'm starting to run out of paper here. Let me, um... So there are two reasons to this. In residential wood construction, we often have a piece of plywood We we'll often have a piece of plywood, and these are either joists or studs. Joists if it's a floor, studs if it's a wall. If we get fire here, this heat starts to radiate off of itself. Have any of you ever tried to light a campfire? You can't just sit a log in the middle of it and take a lighter to it. It will not light. What you need is to make a little cocoon, get a little bit of flame going, and then it needs to radiate off of that. Even then, if you just get your little fire going and put wood all the way around it, it doesn't burn very well. You need that kind of re-radiating surface to get your fire going and to burn. Well, our residential wood construction has re-radiating surfaces. It also has, so that's uh, one part of the problem, the other part of the problem is um, that wood burns away material. I think it's, uh, it's like an inch and a half in an hour, I believe. This piece of wood in our residential construction, that's an inch and a half. It's a two by material or two inch by two inch by six inch or whatever. That is actually only an inch and a half, which means in an hour, it's burning an inch and a half on one side and an inch and a half on the other. 
That really means in 30 minutes, that piece of wood is gone. It doesn't exist. So it has no structure left. So fire rating is really bad. Fire rating is how long will it stay up in the event of a fire. Mass timber, on the other hand, if that's our giant piece of mass timber, and we've got a floor on it that's protecting it like that, and so it's burning around the sides, all of that has burned away, but we're still left with a large amount of lumber in there to do the work. And in a fire event, you have to design for full load capacity at the beginning of the fire, but as the fire rating time in, uh, increases, the amount of load you need to support goes down. So you don't imagine that two hours into a fire, there's still a party happening. You assume the majority of the people have gotten out and now you're trying to make sure any remaining people can also get out or that there's a structure left after the fire's been put out. <clears throat> and so in mass timber, we're left with, there's less material than there was to begin with, but we also have to support smaller loads now. So mass timber can actually be considered having good fire resistance. It will also create a bit of a char layer around it, which can act like insulation. Uh, so same, environmentally neutral in a properly managed forest. Disadvantages, it's combustible. It will in fact burn. So if you have a building that has a flat out clause, uh, no combustible construction, you have to encase it or encapsulate it with something that protects it from the fire, whether it's um, uh, 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 fire protection of some sort, like a spray on fire protection or drywall. Uh, gypsum wallboard or GWB can have fire rated versions of it. And so you can wrap your wood in it. It's not great for vibration. It's got the same connection problems, member size problem and possible decay that regular lumber has. Uh, but we also add in a disadvantage in lead time because like I said, it's very similar to steel. We have shop drawings. It, uh, they might start work right away, but you don't see anything happening on the site for a very long time. <clears throat> Wood applications. So I've broken it into two categories, our nominal lumber or our two by material and mass timber. So for nominal lumber, we've got small residential buildings like houses farm buildings, barns, great for wood construction, temporary structures, anything that has to go up quick and come down quick, and then special structures, simply because you can usually get a workforce there, you can work with small elements, um, you can get very artistic with wood if you want to. Mass timber, mostly anything that you might do with steel is a pretty good thing to do with mass timber, but we have this thing called CLT, which is competing with uh, concrete construction for mid-rise buildings as well. So to say what exactly the mass timber applications are, I can't give you a list because it hasn't worked itself through the system yet. Um, right now, everybody wants to build everything that's not a house in mass timber. Um, uh, so as this persists, we'll start to see this list kind of finish itself out a little bit. So precast concrete, I'll just touch on quickly, only because so many of the things are very similar to regular concrete. Um, it's durable. Uh, one of the differences is, is quality control because precast concrete's made in a plant and anywhere we can go in inside and be warm and look at things is going to be a lot better than on site. We can pre-stress. So pre-stress means that we put something in it to, to either tension something, uh, or in, in concrete's case, we actually want to compress the concrete. And the way we compress the concrete is we have our concrete structure with some tubes in it, and at this end, we'll put a plate on it, and then we pull on that against that plate and connect it at this end. So by pulling this plate this way, we've actually compressed the concrete. Uh, Precast concrete, because of the pre-stressing, we can actually get longer spans got a beautiful finish. It's usually being cast against um, steel. 
So a very, very fine grain, beautiful looking finish. Um, it's non-combustible, which is the same as concrete. Uh, it's got good fire ratings, same as concrete. Um, so it fall, it's got some of the same acoustic properties as concrete. Its disadvantage is that it's often non-ductile. We can't make um, the connections uh, be connected ductile. So concrete, we actually put the steel all the way through where the members join together. It almost looks like one big, gigantic, homogeneous uh, element of construction. Um, whereas precast comes in two discrete pieces and we have to connect it together. Um, you're pretty much stuck with regular grids simply because to make it cost effective, it's got to be you're buying 200 of the same element. Um, and future flexibility, same as our concrete building, we have some of the same problems. Um, <clears throat> we're not, I'm not spending a lot of time on precast, I just wanted to give it a heads up. It's good for parking garages, motels, apartment buildings, schools. Its big one is cladding. It's really good for cladding because um, we can make panelized elements that come and just clip on a concrete or a steel building or even a wood building. Um, they just come and clip on very quickly. So masonry, again, I'm going to go through these quickly because these aren't the most common types, but we do see them a lot. And I found that people always ask the questions, so I added these lists in just to have something as a reference. It's durable, it's economical, it's non-combustible, and it has a good fire rating. Uh, it's got good acoustics, and it's decay and corrosion resistant. Very similar to uh, our concrete. Its disadvantages is speed. It is very slow building with masonry. People do it because it's so cheap quite often. Um, but as um, masons become um, uh, more rare because the, the art of doing masonry construction um, is dying out, it's actually in some ways less economical. It's this kind of funny back and forth that's happening in it right now. Um, but you can't build a whole wall even in a day. You have to do a wall and lift. So you can only go about half a story with a wall and then you have to come back the next day. Um, <clears throat> very limited loading conditions. Uh, quality control is hard. The proportions are quite large. And there hasn't been um, a masonry design code since I think the last one was like 2001. I heard rumors that a new one is coming out. But we don't even have a code for it anymore. Which means that most of the things we can do with masonry are empirical. Meaning that they're not designed They've just been done so often that everyone accepts that it's an okay method of construction, including building departments. But going and doing something unique with masonry becomes very difficult um, from an engineering point of view. It's hard to prove it. Really good for walls in low-rise buildings, um, foundations not retaining earth, and for cladding. <clears throat> so what do we think about when we're picking our material? And I can tell you, I cannot tell you what material to pick. Because the answer isn't always, you must do steel for this type. You must use wood for this type. There are always going to be a wide variety of reasons you pick your material. And usually, you guys are picking that without me or an engineer uh, as part of the discussion because normally you're making a lot of those assumptions early on so precedent like I said every single thing you ever build start with precedent um, and then you would start to branch out from there um, if precedent isn't exactly what you're it isn't exactly what you need well then maybe you'd refine it and then if there's nothing like it in the whole wide world that's when we innovate and I can tell you that uh, mass timber construction, for example, there's not a lot of precedent. It is, um, Dave and I often joke that it's the wild west of engineering right now. Um, because, I mean, we know that Dave's working on at least five buildings that if they were built right now would be the tallest wood building in North America. But we know four other firms that are doing the same thing. Um, what we don't have is precedent to talk about. So everybody is kind of doing their own method right now and doing a lot of research. 
Um, and after some of these get built, then there will start to be precedent and we'll know what worked better. Now, they'll all be safe, but when I say better, I mean what was the most cost effective? What was the quickest? What was the easiest to do? Availability of materials. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, two years ago, you couldn't get wood. Uh, so things that I would have recommended for a deck. I had a friend who built a deck and she couldn't get cedar to build her deck. Normally it would have been ubiquitous. We would have just done a cedar deck. Um, so she had to make a few other choices on what she did there. Um, interestingly enough, open web steel joists are, have a two year back order right now. Um, and uh, I know a project where they're using um, wood instead. They're using glue lamb wood members instead simply because they can't get the steel they can get the wood it's going to cost more than they wanted but they can actually start construction they don't have to wait two years to even build their building because of one particular item cost is obviously going to be an impact um what's your uh, what fire resistance is required so a building that needs a one hour fire rating steel might be the way to go uh, one that needs a two and a half or three hour fire rating, concrete might be the way to go. <clears throat> what's the height and what's the span? We know concrete doesn't do well in long spans, so we might wanna look at steel. Occupant load, self-weight, lateral loads. Remember, lateral loads are the things that tip the building that way. So sometimes uh, in high seismic zones, um, you might not use masonry, for example, because it's hard to get it ductile. We like ductility in, in seismic design. The depth of the floor sandwich. So, um, you know, kind of how, how, thick, how thick can our floor be, for example. Um, what are the serviceability requirements? The deflection requirements. That might change what material you use. Dynamic loading like earthquakes, soil conditions, are there unique soil conditions? If so, <coughs> that might make some changes in how you build your building. Drainage, rentability, future flexibility. Future flexibility is a big one. Adaptive reuse of your building is starting to become a huge player in what you do. Um, if you were building a condo, for example, normally you build a condo on a six meter grid. That just tends to be what you do. It's perfect for rooms in a condo. Um, uh, but concrete, we know, isn't adapt very adaptable. Um, uh, so we know that maybe five years from now or 20 years from now, that that condo might not be a condo anymore. And so maybe what we wanna do is build in flexibility and say uh, a 12 meter grid, for example. Well, once it's at a 12 meter grid, does the concrete work anymore? Maybe we need to switch to a steel design. Um, so understanding future flexibility uh, on your site can be a big deal. I know that um, Dave has said that all of the parking garages they're doing now um, uh, kind of mostly have a, a, like a false floor in between. So they do double height um, stories with um, a second layer of cars in between simply because they know those parking garages might get adapted into condos or something later on. So you can take that out and now you've got higher ceilings than a parking garage. Um, and last but definitely, definitely, definitely not least is architectural. If you have a clear architectural vision of what needs to happen on this project, it might override some of these things. So, um, uh, for example, maybe you know exactly what you want. There is a look that you want, and it might override the cost. Maybe it's telling you that steel is the cheapest construction material, but the vision of it needs it to be a wood structure. That is a valid reason to do it. You should understand it, you should know it, but it is a valid reason. <clears throat> okay, let's just quickly talk about the makeup of the structure. What goes into the structure? Well, structural elements, we can break them down into uh, floors and roofs. So those are the flat plane things, the things in this plane. Our columns and walls, so our things in this plane. 
our lateral load resisting system, which is in the walls as well, but it's also in our floor as well. So it's specific elements in our floor and roof system or a wall and column system that do a very specific job for us. Foundations is everything below ground. And then we have our cladding and miscellaneous elements. Okay, so floors and roofs. What kinds of floors and roofs do we have? Again, this is mostly me just laying out what assemblies that we would have. We would have uh, reinforced concrete slabs. We could do metal deck and beams or joists. So those would be open web steel joists. Wood decking or wood plywood with wood joists and beams. Sheathing or decking with light gauge steel framing. So that would be a competitor to our residential construction. And then other special systems. What's the role of the roof system? What's it doing? Well, it's supporting the environmental loads, uh, possibly occupant loads. Um, so those would be the loads acting downwards or uh, uh, the environmental loads would be like snow and wind. We have to transfer the loads from our, or from our roof area to the perimeter of our building or columns in the center. We want to take that load from acting this way to coming down through elements. It has to support the building envelope like our roofing and insulation. It has to slope to drains. We need that water to go somewhere. It has to have diaphragm action. That's part of our lateral load resisting system. So as much as it's our gravity system, a part of it has to be our lateral load resisting system. So I talked about <clears throat> these being our walls for a lateral load resisting system, but we also need to make sure our building doesn't skew in plan like this. So we need it not to kind of want to squish and move around like that. And so often we put a lateral load resisting system in our floor zone. It tends to be a filled in surface. So a piece of plywood, can be your floor or roof diaphragm. Uh, concrete can be your floor or roof diaphragm. Metal deck can be a floor or roof diaphragm, but they do get designed. Um, and possibly it needs to be uh, part of the fire separation. Most roofs aren't actually fire rated, weirdly enough. You need to not have people fall through the floor, but if the roof falls down on them is a different story. Okay, role of the floor system. Um, <clears throat> support occupant loads, so very, very, very similar to provide the concrete wearing surface or the base for special finishes or coverings. So maybe uh, you need something there to put your floor finish on. If it's concrete, maybe it is the floor finish or you need something there to stick the floor finish to. So metal deck, for example, is shaped like that you can't walk across that, you'd trip on it. So you'd need still some plywood or something on it. All right, this is very similar to the first list about what to consider for your system. So what material are you using, the fire resistance, the span length, these are, these are more here to kind of itemize the separate categories, but these all came directly from the first list of how to pick your material. All right, columns and walls. <clears throat> we can have reinforced concrete columns and reinforced concrete walls. Concrete block, brick, or stone masonry, less common. Structural steel columns with bracing. Wood stud bearing walls. Light gauge steel bearing walls. So what's the role of the walls and columns? And there's a few things. We want to transfer those gravity loads that came from our floor and roof system down to the foundation. And it has a secondary role that it supports the cladding and it also stops the wind load from getting into the building. So the way our gravity loads push down on something, our wind is trying to get inside our building as well. <clears throat> so what's the burden on these compression elements, so our columns and walls? Well, we don't want it to squash under the load. I can't. We don't want it to squash under the load. We don't want it to buckle under the load. We don't want it to deflect too much. <clears throat> and possibly we need it not to bend under wind load. 
So maybe there's wind blowing on it. So notice this isn't buckling, this is bending. Um, and it possibly needs to be part of the lateral load resisting system. So you can imagine this brace system isn't all the work being done by this. Some of the load is in these columns as well. We're actually gonna do a calculation on one of these by the end of the term where we figure out all the internal loads acting on this braced frame. So what types of columns do we have? <clears throat> well, steel, we often use wide flange or hollow sections. They could be square or round, rectangular. They could be composite. You could even go crazy and have trusses as columns. Not as common. And we're gonna look at images of all of this next week. So this is basically the lists. Next week, we're gonna look at a bunch of pictures. Uh, wood columns, so sawn lumber or engineered wood products, built up elements. Concrete, plain or reinforced. Plain is very, very, very uncommon, but if you're gonna use unreinforced concrete, it's probably in the columns. Masonry, plain or unreinforced, very similar to the concrete. Load-bearing walls would often be reinforced concrete, masonry, uh, wood stud with a plywood finish, or a steel stud. <clears throat> what other kind of weird systems can you have? Um, it could be supported by a combination of walls and columns. It could be hangers. Gold ring center for high performance sports. The trusses span 54 meters on the four, between the fourth and fifth floor, and the third floor and second floor are hung from the underside of the fourth floor. So it isn't supported down to the ground. It's not a truss. It does not span the distance. It spans short distances and gets hung from the underside of the truss above. I'm gonna draw that for you. I know most of you probably have a really good visual in your head of what that looks like, but I'm gonna draw it anyway. <clears throat> so if this is our building spanning the distance. This truss goes all the way across, so it can span that whole distance. So this is an elevation of our building. And then we have short sections that go between the hangers and the hangers are attached to the underside of the truss. Now remember the Gold Ring Center for High Performance Sports drawings are posted. And on one of the first pages, there's a really nice little key plan or a key elevation that just kind of shows you the intent of what's happening. Transfer beams. A transfer beam <clears throat> would be, uh, kind of something similar where we've got so we've got our roof up here maybe there's some other floors in here so we've got a few floors here and we want this to span all the way across here because we want this open under here well, all of, so this column is picking up that tributary width or area, and that one's picking up that. So each one of these columns has a smaller area, but this beam, look, it's picking up everything from here to here. It would probably want to be a truss. <clears throat> no matter what we're doing though, we're trying to get the loads uh, to the foundation, whether it's by walls and columns or by hangers and transfer beams, but it still goes over to the end. So my truss for gold ring, yeah, this goes from the floor beam to a hanger, up the hanger to a truss, over to a column, down to the foundation. So you should always stop and think for yourself, if I put a weight right here, how does that get down? To, how does that get to the foundation? Maybe it's right at the top of the column and the weight goes straight down the column. That's easy. If you put it at the middle of the beam, it's kind of like my, my table example. At the middle of the table, you know, half of the weight's going to one column, half of the weight's going to the other, and it's going down to the ground. So try to get yourself in the habit of doing that. 
drawing that is not a free body diagram. And I'm just going to say that now because people tend to do that often. Okay. Um, perimeter walls above grade and perimeter walls below grade. Above grade, we'll do masonry, concrete, precast concrete, wood or metal stud. Below grade, we'll do reinforced concrete. We might do plain concrete. We might do masonry and we might do preserved wood. But we wouldn't do, we wouldn't do uh, steel or regular wood below grade. It would rot and rust and get ruined and we'd need material in between. So again, what to consider when picking your columns and walls? This is all elements from the same list as before, just kind of focused specifically on the columns uh, and walls, but they're all the same things from the what material do you pick overall for your building? And that's usually gonna be the answer. Well, what's your overall building? What's your building material? If you can use that, go with that. If not, then go back to your list and look at your list for that particular element. Um, what can you do to help design that system or your supporting system, your gravity system, your columns? Um, a regular layout helps. I'm not saying you have to do a regular layout, but having a regular layout helps. You saw in the example last week when we had all kinds of beams that looked identical to each other, meaning they were the same length and had the same tributary width, they could all be the same beam. And that makes things A, easier to build, B, easier to engineer, C, cheaper, uh, because you're buying more of the same thing. You should make use of architectural elements, meaning if you've got them, use them. If you've got walls uh, every so often, use the uh, walls structurally. Um, load, lateral load resisting elements. So make use of your lateral load resisting elements if you've got them. Repetition is huge, like I said when we were talking about the regular layout, but it can be huge for things like open web steel joists. Um, if you've got the same element doing the same thing 300 times, it becomes very cost effective to look at um, getting a supplier uh, uh, created element. Um, multiple story uh, column lifts. So that would be, um, so in this example here, see how I drew this as a column and this as a column? Well, do they bring in three separate columns? Do they make it three separate columns? One big column, a two story column and a one story column? It really depends. It can be a big part about the design um, but allowing multiple story uh, columns, they like to do two or three stories with a single column because they can support themselves for a little bit during construction. And minimizing transfer. Things like this are expensive. Things like this are expensive. Um, if you can get things to go right down to the ground in that spot, do it. It's cheaper. Don't do it just because. Don't put a truss uh, or a long span element in if you don't need to. All right, lateral load resisting systems. When do you need them? Every floor, every direction, every building. I want that just repeated. I am going to give you this question on the exam. I promise. I might even be like, hey, when do you need a lateral load resisting system? By the way, the answer is every floor, every direction, every building in a multiple choice question and people will still get it wrong. I cannot understand what's happening there. I've literally said, hey, the answer is option D in the question and people have not picked it. Um, but every floor, every direction, every building. What's the role of the lateral load resisting system? It's gotta carry the lateral loads due to wind and earthquake from the floor diaphragm to the foundation. So we have wind blowing on our building and it, this kind of starts to act like a beam in this direction though, instead of this direction. So it's got wind acting on it and it wants to skew like that. All right, so instead we make it a diaphragm. So we've got wind blowing on it and now it doesn't squish around. When I tried to do that with this, 
it just collapsed. All right, so we make it rigid like this, and now this load is going to the perimeter elements. So now we have to see what keeps it from tipping over. So now this is one of our walls. We don't want our walls to tip over like that. So we put a brace or a shear wall in there to stop it from tipping over. All right, the burden, it can't fail under the load. We have to stop the building from excessively deflecting. Remember, we have deflection criteria on it. So we need it to be strong enough. We need it to be stiff enough. And we need it to stop the building from tipping or sliding. Strong enough, stiff enough, stable. So every system in our building needs to be strong enough, stiff enough, and stable. So what are the types of lateral load resisting systems? Well, shear walls. Shear walls are where every single bit of it is our element. Um, we can do concrete, masonry, or wood. Plywood makes a great shear wall. Bracing. So here's a diagonal brace. Sometimes you'll see two of them like that, making an X brace. Um, an A-framed or a three-pinned arch. So if you take two elements like this that look like two hockey sticks and prop them up and you pin these together here, and you pin these to the ground, it actually can't tip over. It's a fun little thing to try to build. Um, uh, take some popsicle sticks if you want and glue them kind of where my, my hands join together like that and then put like a pin or a thumbtack or something through those points and hold it here. You can't make it tip over. And then moment frames, sometimes you'll hear them called portal frames. Um, if I took this and glued these together, that would be a moment frame. Anywhere you need glue in building a model, you want a moment frame. Um, we're going to look at um, a whole series of slides where moment frames are really expensive, a lot of material, and they still don't perform as well as braces and shear walls. We like them when we use them because they give us an opening, but don't think they're the answer to all things. So what do we think about when we're picking a lateral load resisting system? Well, obviously you start with the industry standard. If you're doing, if you're doing a house, you're gonna start with a wood shear wall. Maybe you do something else if you don't have enough shear wall in your building to do its job. Um, it needs some flexibility. It has, to, uh, um, uh, it has to be able to resist the applied load. So what are the applied loads? Is it um, a place with uh, low wind and low seismic like Toronto? What if it's in a hurricane zone like Florida or in a high seismic zone like California? That could impact what your lateral load resisting system is. And again, if the rest of your building is wood construction, eh, start with wood construction. So what are common lateral load resisting systems for different types of buildings? For wood frame construction, perimeter wood stud shear walls. So we're going to have studs with plywood stuck to it. Hotels and condos are usually going to be a concrete shear wall. Schools are often load-bearing masonry shear walls. They're not very tall, they're low rise, they're usually only two stories high. And for that kind of construction, they're pretty common. Commercial construction, it might be concrete shear walls, tilt up walls. Uh, it could be steel, but most commercial buildings are, are mid rise concrete buildings. Industrial buildings and warehouses, brace frames. They're going to be brace frames. They will always be base brace frames. They're going to be a brace frame. High rise buildings. It's going to depend on what type of construction it is. And there's no one answer because we've seen all of them. So it could be a concrete shear wall. It could be a concrete core. It could be steel bracing. And we see lots of buildings that have a combination of these things. Arenas are going to be moment frames or A frames. So that's these frames that prop up against each other in the short direction and then X bracing in the long direction. Okay. Mo I always say it's never an engineer's job to say no. It's our job to help make your vision a re reality. The one place where I might have to say no is when it comes to seismic design.
There are certain things that we cannot skirt around. We have to do it. It's very explicit in the code. Um, so what can't we do to our lateral load resisting system in Toronto? Well, we can't have a weak story. So you see this building here, we have a lateral load resisting system that's a great braced frame here, but not one that comes all the way down to the ground. We need it to be, and why do we do this? We often see a lot of the failures in buildings that were hit by seismic uh, zones. They had great rigid structures up above just by default. They maybe weren't even intended to be the lateral load resisting system. And then on the bottom floor, they want a more open space. They have a lateral load resisting system. It was designed for it, but somehow in the action of the seismic uh, load, the shifting um, of that from the other spots of the building to the lateral load resisting system that's bigger and heavier in one spot uh, can't get there. Uh, and so they've just made the mandate no weak stories. So we can't have less lateral load resisting system than the floors above it. And we can't have too much torsion. Um, and so that would be in, in, our, in our roof, if we have a lateral load resisting system over here and we, it tries to, to bend, it wants to twist as well. We don't want too much twisting in our building. So think of torsion as twisting of our building. We can't have too much torsion. What can't we do for lateral load resisting systems in high seismic zones? We can't do these two things. We can't shift the lateral load resisting system. So if I have uh, walls over here where there's the lateral load resisting system and then I want to shift it over to here, I can't do that. And I can't ignore capacity design options. Now, that's way above anything we're going to talk about, but you might hear the term tossed around. Capacity design is about um, limiting how much load a certain spot sees. Normally what we do is we say, okay, there's this high load here. We're going to put something strong enough there to resist it. Capacity design, we say, we want to make sure load doesn't go to that spot. And if it does, we need a fuse that limits the amount of load there. We have to make the load go somewhere else. And we need to make sure that element isn't too strong. If we make it strong enough for the high load, it will attract the high load and we don't want the high load there. We want it to be dispersed. And so designing for capacity design is a big part of seismic design. I said there's been no great advances in most of the stuff I'm telling you about. Seismic is one of the spots where we've seen so much advancement. Even in the way seismic design is done since I started engineering 20 years ago is drastically different, like really drastically different. Um, and so uh, uh, these are some really important things that they've implemented to help prevent some of the seismic disasters we've seen. All right, so what are the takeaway tips? It's the same for uh, studying and uh, what you need to know in the future because this whole lecture was it's actually a hard one to test on because I'm just trying to give you information that sets you up for the future and to have an understanding of how buildings go together in this course. Next week's gonna be the same because mostly we're just gonna look at pictures of these things. I'll try to tell some stories to make it somewhat exciting. So you should know what the role of the structure is. You should know the major construction materials and their strengths and weaknesses or their advantages and disadvantages. You should have a, an idea of how we pick our material. You should know the major parts of a building, so like roof, floor, columns, walls, brace frames. You should know what a lateral load resisting system is and what types of lateral load resisting systems we have. So <clears throat> again, I apologize that this lecture was so chopped up. Um, uh, it's constant chaos here right now. Um, Dave, has taken them for a drive. I guess technically we're not supposed to leave our property again, but we just quarantined for five days. We had one day, um, I kept them home. Just, I just felt like five days wasn't enough and then they got fevers last night. Um, so he's not, he's just, just taking them for a drive, uh, taking them out at an abandoned park, a beach, 
uh, and then they're driving home. But uh, we're all here together in our house all the time, um, and we're trying to work a, a crazy amount and do school and look after a three-year-old and potty train and and have been sick. So uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll have some understanding. Um, I try not to make the lectures quite so chopped up, uh, and hopefully it'll get better by the end of the term. And I, the lectures won't be in person, but hopefully I'll be in the building a few times uh, coming after February 7th. So uh, have a great day.